the introduction. And I got that, and for liking my drawing. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, be with you, even though only virtually, to uh, tell you a little bit about one of my passions called astroseismology. Okay. And I'm going to specifically focus on the gravito inertial side of things today. If you don't know what that is, that's fine. Um, let me give you a straight away a take home message. Huh? Uh, we're going to do gravito inertial modes. These have low frequencies. And the nice thing about them is that they really give direct and localized information of the stellar interior, specifically of stars that have a convective core. And the surrounding area here is where all the action lies in the life of such stars. And so these, this is my, uh, my favorite type of uh, mode for that. Now, how do we do that? Eh? On the graph, you see here one Kepler light curve uh, in the left panel of 1500 days. In the right panel, a zoom on uh, uh, like 20 ish days, and you see beautiful oscillations beating against each other uh, positive interference, negative interference. And the art is to get the information from the physics of that near core region out of such a light curve. Eh? So that's what we will be doing. So what's in a light curve? Well, seismic waves created by the uh, up and down motions of the non-radial modes, right? Here you see again a light curve in the upper graph, already a zoom in now, again, gravity modes that have beautiful um, uh, signature, seismic signature, right? And if you remember from uh, you know, studying periodic phenomena in a sphere, because that's basically what we're uh, using as an approximation, uh, a periodic uh, phenomenon that is a sign uh, variability in the time series of whatever quantity that you're measuring, and here is the relative brightness that we measure from space. If you Fourier transform that, well, then you get a high peak at the frequency of your oscillation. And that's what you see in the lower panel, of course. Um, so what we are doing as seismologists is Fourier transform the brightness variations that satellites measure for us from space at very high precision. And in that Fourier transform, you see the amplitudes of the uh, eigenmodes as upper bars here. And for this star, for instance, it has dominant oscillations in the frequency region around 75 microhertz, right? You see various oscillations because there's not a single peak, it's not a single sign, it's a, it's a complex beating pattern of sinusoidal variability, right? And so these Fourier transforms help us tremendously to get the eigenfrequencies of the star on our plates. And these eigenfrequencies are actually uh, shapes, huh? they get their value from the interior of the star where the waves have their dominant energy. Huh? And for gravito inertial waves, this is deep, deep, deep down in the interior. And from an evolutionary point of view, that's what we want to learn, all right? Now, we can do this uh, uh, since what I call the space age, which is about a decade old only. This is very recent. Huh? Why? Because if you want to uh, unravel the eigenfrequencies from such a Fourier transform, well, then you better work with uninterrupted data. And we're doing star quakes, tiny little variations, yeah, uh, parts per thousand to parts per million. So when we try that from the ground, and we have tried that for many, many years, huh? Well, then the, the fluctuations in the Earth atmosphere really bother us. And the fact that we can only during the night do our work bother us even more. So ever since the space age, uh, starting uh, with Coro, uh, uh, launched in 2006, operational for six years, then we have the magnificent Kepler. And now we have the also magnificent TESS, which is literally uh, operating right now uh, for us. For us, that is to say, to hunt exoplanets, it's fine. You can all have your exoplanets just as long as I can have my star curves, all right? And so we have, in fact, hundreds of thousands of light curves, like two of which I've shown, to, to work with. So from the observational side of things, we are swamped with data, right? Now, the art is to get the physics out of the data. Yeah. So how do we work? Well, a little bit of simple background. A star, we approximate it as a, a, a gaseous sphere. It is rotating around an axis. 
and it has eigenmodes yeah, and eigenfrequencies. How do you get to derive them? From a theoretical point of view, you have your stellar structure equations, uh, conservation laws of physics that your gaseous sphere has to fulfill. And then you perturb that and you're assuming that we are in the linear approach. That is to say, we consider non-radial oscillation modes uh, in the linear regime. Yeah. So your, your uh, up and down motions are supposed to be small compared to the total radius of the star. Yeah. In that case, if that's the case, and if your star, if your star is a slow rotator, then you can describe each of these eigenmodes by a spherical harmonic. And that's what you see on the graph here. Uh, this is a spherical harmonic of degree two. There are two white bands. These uh, particles don't move during the oscillation. The red and the blue ones, they do. Uh, red is moving away from you. Blue is coming towards you. And so you see the, the surface pattern of this mode and the interior pattern described by the number of nodes in the uh, interior of the star, which you cannot directly see, of course, because uh, that is what's happening inside. Yeah? Now, if we move that, or if we translate what I just said into a, a mathematical formula, yeah, then each oscillation mode has a displacement vector described by a spherical harmonic. And this spherical harmonic is active with a certain period of the mode or a frequency of the mode denoted here as omega, the angular eigenmode frequency. It depends on the degree of the mode on the azimuthal order. So the azimuthal order is the number of nodal lines, white lines, through the symmetry axis, which we usually take as a rotation axis. And that's how you describe your eigenmode. So you have a, a spatial part, which is the spherical harmonic, and you need to know what it is. And you have a temporal part, which is the frequency of the oscillation mode. And we have not one one mode active, but hundreds of them, right? Now, these modes, they have difficult physical, different physical uh, uh, property, let's say, depending on the dominant acting restoring forces. And I've listed five of them here. So we have the, the two basic ones, the, the pressure force. If that's the dominant restoring force, you create acoustic waves. Huh? You know them very well, sound waves. If buoyancy, on the other hand, is a dominant restoring force, we speak of gravity waves. Huh? These have a different character. They have uh, um, uh, usually a lower frequency than the acoustic waves. And the acoustic waves go up and down and up and down because it's pressure that is a dominant force. Uh, um, here, but with gravity, they have mainly a more horizontal motion than vertical motion. In a rotating star, and all stars rotate, no matter how slow, we also have a Coriolis force. And if that force is acting as dominant restoring force, you create what we call inertial waves. If your star is magnetic, we create uh, uh, we have a Lorentz force huh? and we create alphane waves. And if you're uh, uh, in a binary or a multiple system in general and tides come into play, then, then, then we speak of tidal wave. Now, three of these uh, um, wave types are indicated in dark blue. Why is that? Well, um, that's because the other two are in red and the red is actually the message that I want to bring. Gravity waves and inertial waves, they typically have periodicities of the order of a day. Now, if you want to do that type of astroseismology from the ground, you're really screwed because we happen to live on a planet that revolves with a period of a day. And that is horrible to disentangle. Yeah. So it's really only thanks to the uh, NASA Kepler mission that we made an immense progress here. Corot was a precursor. It helped us discover gravity modes in stars. But the five months of the Corot mission that it focused on fields of view was too short, actually, to, de to do this work. So that already tells you that gravito-inertial astroseismologists like me, we have to be very patient. And the four years of Kepler data for us is fantastic. Yeah? Um, let me still give a recap for those of you who are more or not familiar with modes at all. Let's start with the easy cases. So the, the sun is, of course, the, the best star that we know in helioseismology for us set to see. But all stars like the sun having an outer convection zone. They have uh, stochastic excitation uh, via the turbulence in the convective envelope, and that creates sound waves, typically. Now, sound waves have high frequency. 
uh, for the sun, the, the strongest uh, solar uh, quakes, they, they peak typically at 3000 microhertz. Here is uh, 16 sick and uh, uh, an almost copy of the sun, you would say. A spectroscopist would, would call it a copy. An astroseismology is not. Why not? Because you see the dominant uh, power of the oscillations peaks around, let's say here, huh, 2150 ish microhertz. Yeah? So this is lower than the 3000 of the sun. So this is a bigger star. And that's just like a musical instrument, right? The tones, the frequencies go down as your instrument is bigger. So this star is bigger. And from that, uh, you can see why I've indicated here that we can derive very effectively in the Fourier transform of the light curve, how big a star is, if it is a sun-like star with solar-like oscillations created by the outer envelope, eh? because that uh, you can scale. Now you also see there is a pattern here. There is what we call the big frequency pattern. In the asymptotics of high frequencies in the equations, you can show that there is regularity. You see it here in front of you um, for a real case. And the spacings between uh, modes of equal degree what we call the large spacing is actually a measurement of the, the mean the density inside your star and in stars like the sun you can immediately couple that uh, when you have the radius uh, because you know that from the frequency of maximum power to the mass of the star so by measuring this large frequency spacing along with the frequency of maximum power you can actually deduce with a very high precision the mass and the radius of your star now you can also derive more from what we call the small frequency spacing, and this is a, a between a quadrupole and radial modes. Typically, you can work that out. This is not a measurement of the sound speed, but of the sound speed gradient inside your star. And as the star lives its life, it creates ever more helium in its center, and so the gradient of the sound speed is big there because your sound speed is all of a sudden has a hiccup where it encounters the helium core, right? And that's, of course, a direct measurement of the age of the star. Huh? So age dating stars becomes possible. <laughs> it's not so easy to derive ages of stars, right? So this is what you get in the simple case of acoustic oscillations. So the talk is not going to work further from that. This is pretty standard. You can do it for all stars that have outer convection zones, including red giants that are very near to the end of their life. And this is how uh, galactic archaeologists like our work, because all of a sudden they have a, a good age dating too. Huh? But I am taking you to a different case. Before I do that, I, send you, I, I show you a gallery here of red giants that have been observed by the K2 mission, which is sort of the refurbished Kepler after it uh, lost its two of its uh, gyroscopes. And what you see here is a gallery from Denis Tello's paper. Beautiful black signal, and it goes to lower and lower and lower and lower and lower frequency. What do you see happening? The stars are climbing up the red giant branch and are increasing their size. So this is stellar evolution in action, right? Uh, I still find this uh, amazing every day if I look at it. So by, by looking at the way the maximum power shifts to lower frequency, you get an increase in size and you get older as a star. Yeah. So what people who do acoustic uh, mode astroseismology do is scale the physics of the sun according to these very famous scaling relations that were already invented uh, before space astroseismology started. And if you have a spectroscopic effective temperature measurement, you do really get a very high precision radius, mass, age, mean density, gravity of the star, which is very convenient. As a service, we astroseismologists deliver that to all sorts of topics, including exoplanetary studies and uh, galactic structure studies. Now we're going to leave that regime on the right here. We were here so far, and we're going to move here to lower frequencies. The gravity modes of stars, they are dominantly restored by buoyancy, and they have low frequency values for their eigenmodes. And then you have to care about the interplay between the rotation frequency of your star and the mode frequencies, uh, because stars happen to have rotation periods of like, um, let's say uh, a fraction of a day until very many days. Huh? So in the, in the low frequency regime, you have to care 
when the Coriolis force happens uh, or is connected to a rotation frequency that comes in the neighborhood of your buoyancy frequency, which sets the mode cavity of gravity modes. Yeah. And so in reality, we do not have the simplistic situation that we can do our equations while ignoring the rotational uh, uh, forces or the Lorentz force if you're uh, in, in, in the magnetic stuff. Huh? But let's start easiest. Here is again such a gallery, a nice gallery. I, I love this plot. It's made by one of my former PhD students, so I'm a bit biased. You see again uh, seven stars here, Kepler data, beautiful uh, light curves of uh, quite a variety. And again, there is a trend here. So overplotted is in red now is the Fourier transform. And there's again this trend from high up to low down. With acoustic modes, as I showed before, that was, you know, big star going to smaller stars. Here, this has nothing to do with the size of the star. These are gravito inertia modes. And here, the position of this Fourier transforms and this, the, the character of the peaks in the Fourier transform, well, they tell me that this star is a very slow rotator. And as I go down, the stars have faster and faster rotation. Rotation in the position where the gravitational inertial modes have their strongest probing power. And that's adjacent to the core of the convective core. These are B-type stars. These are stars with masses between typically three and nine solar masses. They have a fierce convective core that is fully mixed. And the gravity modes, they travel in the radiative part of the star and they have their highest mode energy right next to the core. And that's exactly where we want to learn about the physics, okay? So now how do I know that this is a measurement of the near core rotation rate? That's out of experience. Huh? So let, let me walk you through that. Let's assume we have a, a, a B-type star huh, in, the, in the cartoon here. Um, so here we are in the regime of low frequencies. So the systematics that you have seen before in the acoustic regime was a pattern that gives a frequency spacing. Here we have a pattern that gives a period spacing, periods of the modes. Huh? If the frequency is low, then one over the frequency is high, and that's the period of the mode. And that gives a regularity. And you see that plotted, that regularity plotted here. Let's look at this star, the upper one. Uh, the gray symbols here are for a non-rotating star. So here I'm safe to ignore the Coriolis force. And what you see plotted is the uh, difference in the mode periods between modes of consecutive radial order, uh, just as for a, a, a large frequency spacing of acoustic modes. But now it's uh, uh, I do the period of a mode that has a radial order, let's say 10, like in the cartoon, minus the same uh, mode, but then with a radial order 9, let's say, okay? And then you see that this is about 4,000 seconds, right? And we plot that against the periods of these modes. And so each dot here is an eigenmode of this particular uh, stellar mode, right? So you see some regularity here, and you see sort of a periodic deviation from a constant value. Now, if stars rotate, and all stars do, then you must make a distinction between uh, the, the gravity waves that are uh, moving along the rotation or against the rotation. Eh? And if your wave moves along the rotation, it will come into your line of sight faster because the rotation and the waves are traveling together. Right? If your wave travels opposite to the rotation, then we call it a retrograde wave. Then it takes longer before uh, you see it back in your line of sight in the same way. Yeah. So if you have prograde modes, as we call it, so working along with the rotation, your frequency hmm, or your period, let's talk periods at once, it comes back at you faster if you have rotation versus non-rotation. So the periods of the modes, as seen in an inertial frame of an observer, are lower, shorter, I should say. And if you subtract two numbers that are smaller, then your value is smaller. So what does that mean? If your star rotates, this pattern gets tilted to shorter periods and lower period spacings, right? And for this star, this rotates at 5% of its critical rotation, this one at 10%, et cetera, and this one at 20%. So what do you see? Well, if you can deduce the frequencies of the gravito-inertial waves, 
you have their periods by inverting them, you subtract their periods and you put them in such a diagram, then the slope that you see in the pattern is an immediate measure of the near core rotation frequency of your star. This was unknown before we had four year Kepler light curves in an analyzable way. So this started only in 2015 and we have no sun to calibrate because we're looking at phenomena that are not happening in the sun. The sun doesn't have fast rotation uh, in a convective core, right? So do stars do this? Huh? Because the previous graph was admittedly uh, stellar models. Huh? Yes, these are real stars and they do it. Yeah. So here you see to guide your eye, uh, again, a Fourier transform, but mind you now, the x-axis is not frequency, it's period, eh, because we are in that asymptotic regime. And the red lines, they sort of guide your eye to see the pattern here. If you're not used to it, then that might help. And here you have a star, this beautiful star with this kick number, a downward trend. These are prograde modes. It's as simple as that, right? And here it also has retrograde modes working against the rotation in the traveling uh, uh, spatially against the rotation, right? And so by measuring the slope of this pattern, you can actually immediately say how fast the rotation of the star is. Yeah? Now, as said, we can try to do this since uh, a very few years. And we, we, we are able to, but it's very important to have some different teams uh, setting up methodology because we have to train ourselves and learn. Eh? This is uh, something that we have to learn. The beautiful thing is there are about four different methods to derive rotation frequencies, and they all uh, work fantastically uh, consistently. So we are very confident we can derive rotation frequencies of stars, and we have done that by now, the community, when I say we, that's the community working in this field, and we have beautiful young people joining, I find it fantastic, about 1800 stars where this has worked from Kepler data. We need Kepler data to do this, right? Now here they are in, in, in this uh, core rotation frequency plotted as a function of gravity to make them comparable with all the Regine people who love uh, Regine's astroseismology, uh, acoustic modes as well, beautiful. But then you see here in the early lives of the stars because these will all become Regine later on. Um, you see how this how big the spread is in near core rotation frequency, and what we actually found was uh, a, not according to the theory that almost all these stars have nearly rigid rotation. It's something that we have to work on because the theory is not um, according to what we thought prior to uh, space astroseismology. Now, why is this important? because of the chemical evolution of the star. Because if stars rotate in their interior and they do it fast near their convective core, yeah, in this overshoot area, as it is called, right, then you mix matter much more efficiently. That's at least what we anticipate. Eh? Rotational mixing is a microscopic phenomenon. Now, other than that, we have the nuclear burning that changes your chemistry. And we also have microscopic uh, uh, phenomena due to atomic diffusion. Heavy elements tend to sink and uh, light elements tend to levitate. And you have the radiative levitation that pushes also uh, outward against uh, gravity, let's say, right? So once we have the rotation determined for all these stars, and we have very many now, we can look at the consequences for the mixing and see if the 30-year-old uh, theory of rotational mixing, for instance, if that works, right? Well, maybe we need something in addition, at least to this, uh, to this rotational mixing. And this was uh, found by this star, it's one of my pet stars, a B star, where we have done forward astroseismic modeling. And you see the best forward model in blue here when we assume that there is no envelope mixing. Why do we assume that for this star? Because it's an ultra slow rotator. And then you see in the residuals, it's not clear. There is periodic deviation. Ha, that is chemical mixing that we're looking at. We don't know per se the cause. It could be rotation, but it's a, a star that has a rotation period of about 200 days. It's extremely low. So if you add envelope mixing, you really improve the modeling. And what we are doing now, and I'm showing uh, my student Vincent here, I always show a picture of a student if I show something that's unpublished. We are now developing inversion methods where we hope to um, improve the stellar modeling by 
investigating the physical ingredient that causes this mixing. And that's what you see here. So in inversion, what do you do? You exploit the deviation from the frequencies that you measure and from the frequencies that you have in a model by reconstructing a, a pattern, an important function that is uh, not perfectly assumed in the theory. Solar physicists do that by the sound speed. Yeah? Here we have the brun feisler frequency. I will not go into detail. You can ask me about it. This is uh, still very first ideas and uh, of new inversion methods. But bottom line is, if you do that, then you get a higher peak in the brun feisler frequency. And the blue here is the improved version from the inversion. So we can now start to deduce chemical profiles because the brun feisler frequency in such stars has a chemical gradient that is dominant in there. And so this can lead us to an improved higher level of mixing and the theory behind it. And then you see that even for a star that is an ultra slow rotator, we do need mixing uh, happening. I'm speeding up a bit because my time is running out. Um, what we have done now is created or tested eight theories of mixing inside stars on a sample of B stars, just to see, can we unravel them? So like constant envelope mixing, eh? so here's the mixing profile, the fully mixed convective core, the overshoot region, and then envelope mixing, envelope mixing due to waves. Eh? Waves also uh, transport particles uh, due to shear instabilities, usually coupled to rotation, or due to rotational mixing uh, with shear together. And then we evaluate which of these theories works best. Well, we have some answers. It seems that uh, the convective penetration coupled to shear instabilities works best. And this is a work uh, in a, um, a recent uh, Nature Astronomy paper by one of my former students, where you see the 26 stars. And here you see the size of the convective core as a function of the mass of the convective core. And you see stellar evolution in action again, because the younger ones have bigger convective cores and you shrink along the evolution downward. Now, what is interesting is that there is a correlation of the macroscopic mixing that we deduce from the seismology and the rotation frequency, but it's not a, a clean one relationship, particularly because there are also two stars done by other teams independently from us, and they are slow rotators with an incredible amount of mixing. Okay, we can compare that with eclipsing binaries. Again, you can ask me about it. I have no time to discuss it, but the bottom line is that if we use all the eclipsing binaries and we look at the amount of helium that you can construct by the time that you reach the end of the main sequence, you can create twice as much helium than anticipated in standard theory that has no uh, envelope mixing. So for the chemical evolution of the galaxy, this is really an important result, I would say. All right. So you know now what uh, we are achieving. What's the caveat? We are assuming that these stars are spheres. And in my uh, future plan, I have uh, uh, the ambition to improve that and to look at these cartoons here on the right and to realize that the higher the rotation frequency, the more the stars are oblate. And we need to take that into account. Uh, I think I'm going to stop here. I, we are doing the first steps. This is, again, uh, one of my PhD students' results. So you see a picture. But in, uh, in the interest of time, if there is an interest in that, I will go into details how we do that. We are coupling multi-D structure uh, models to uh, uh, 1D evolution models. And then we can work out what is important or, or how important this oblateness is. But let me end by my- Would you, would you tell us yeah. about that, please? <laughs> I can, but you know, let me formally end the seminar okay. and then you sorry, can ask sorry, sorry. questions about it. Here is my dream for the next 10 years, and I, I can also explain you about that, but I prefer that you ask me questions, actually. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, well, uh, everyone, uh, feel free to um, type questions in the chat to me, and then I will... Um, uh, calling you to ask them, um, but uh, maybe I can um, use my mm -hmm. privilege to ask you to tell us a little bit more about sort of the multidimensional perspective. Um, okay, so so let me. Thank go you. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's 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 why I'm uh, I'm 
putting a lot of graphs in my slides so that you can see what I wanted to say in case time is running out. <laughs> so, so stars are not spheres, they are flattened spheroids, right? And so what we have been doing is uh, uh, setting up a nice collaboration with uh, Michel Riotor, who is a, a geophysicist, astrophysicist in Toulouse. He has a 2D structure code called Esther. Uh, he would say Esther because he's French speaking. And what does Esther do? It, it computes um, fully consistently two-dimensional stars, yeah? um, flattened by rotation, where he takes on board all transport processes due to rotation in a self-consistent way. Now, what we have also learned in, uh, in the gravito inertial astroseismology of F-type stars, because Joey, my student here, is working on F-type stars, is that these stars also have atomic diffusion. And you might think it's not so important, but it is. It is equally important than the rotation. And this is maybe a, a bit of a surprise, huh? but F stars do live long and the, 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 the settling and the radiative levitation, they do accumulate. So what Joey has been doing, thanks to the help of Aaron Dotter, who was uh, formerly uh, attached to your um, university, um, and who is a, a MESA expert. So we have uh, encoded, Joey has encoded a faster way to do radiative levitation and to translate the rotational uh, shear um, uh, profile that comes from an Esther 2D structure model and plugged it into MESA because Esther cannot do stellar evolution. It is a structure code. And of course, we want to do stellar evolution. For our work, we want to age the stars. And then you get this mixing profile that you see here. So again, the convective core, a penetrative convection, because we seem to find for B stars that this works better for these stars as a description. And then this sheer uh, rotational mixing profile that comes straight out of this uh, Esther model of the uh, star that we have. And this is for one star where we have done forward modeling in a spherical assumption. We know it's not perfect. And we also know that we can't really fit the mode trapping of, that, of these stars. Right? And so if you do this coupling of this uh, higher dimensionality, let's say, then you can predict how the oscillation modes look like. You get such a signature, which is uh, similar to what we see in these stars. This is uh, varying the mass and this is varying the metallicity because of course, metallicity has an immense impact on radiative levitation. Um, so this is where it stands. We have improved a factor for the speed with which MESA can handle the evolution of these stellar models right now. This is unpublished. Well, it's submitted, as you see. Um, we actually, just before this talk, got a referee report, <laughs> which is very uh, positive. So it will soon be in the literature. And then we can improve something that was a, quite a failure so far on my behalf. Huh? Uh, all our gravito inertial forward modeling of F-type stars told us that we can't use envelope mixing, because if we put it in, we destroy all the beautiful mode trapping. Now it turns out that rotational mixing works one way and the radiative levitation works against it. And if you put these two together, then we end up with realistic mixing levels as you see them plotted here, right? Sorry, this was again a mini lecture. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that answers your question more or less that you had, but this is work in progress is coming up. This is amazing. Um... So uh, I think Charlie has a question. If you want to go ahead and unmute, um, to do so. Sure. Uh, hi, Connie. That was a wonderful talk. Um, Thank you. Hi, Charlie. So I guess my question's in the broad category of what we can learn about the evolution of the rotation of the core. So mm -hmm. as I understand, right, you can directly from the seismology measure the current rotation of the core. And then th all this mixing stuff must be more of a kind of integrated effect. Um, so is there a way to combine them in some way to learn about the history of rotation or, or is it just that most of these mixing actually is, is kind of a more instantaneous measure? Uh, well, it's, when you say integrated, we really do probe the positions, in different positions in the star where this mixing is, going, is happening. So in principle, that's why we are developing new inversion methods, but th there is nothing like this in the literature. So 
I'm, I'm uh, very happy to have a very clever student unraveling that. So per star, we can deduce it layer by layer if we succeed in improving our initial mathematical formulae. But then, of course, we see this whole diversity of stars that have different mixing levels. And so they translate immediately to very different chemical, chemical production. And I, I guess for people like you, <laughs> you want to integrate that across the galaxy, right? So, so you, you, you better have some understanding of which parameters in the star determine the amount of helium that you get somewhere in the core, but also how the different layers of the star have their mixing uh, distribution, let's say. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, uh, Charlie, but uh, I mean, you know, if you take one of these eight theories, the consequence of this is quite different for the different theories. And what we do now for the moment is measure the height of these green shapes, mixing shapes. But we want to do better and we want to also not only have the global integrated height and consequence, but also the interior position inside the star. And so for this, I, I need some more time. Huh? We, uh, we have only really started with a, a set, a very clever student, and I'm very pleased with what we have, but I need, I need a few more, uh, I need some more time, let's say, to, to, uh, to develop okay. this. Can, can I ask a, a follow-up question? I, just yeah. to maybe clarify what I was, I think, trying to get at is, if the star went through an earlier phase where the core was very rapidly rotating, mm -hmm. And then, but 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 today it's more slowly rotating in the core. Mm -hmm. Would that earlier phase of of rapid rotation and this consequent mixing leave an, a fingerprint on the present mm -hmm. day structure? Absolutely okay. correct. And so by we have uh, sixty eight stars with what I call, to my standards, good gravito inertial forward modeling. <laughs> That's all. That's to totally insufficient, right? but we had zero until five years ago and we had to invent new methodology. So you have to see it like that. It's not like the tens of thousands of red giants. So there you just scale the sun. I mean, that's simple. Um, so, so we have to fill diagrams like this because if, if I look at these stars, these are very slow rotators, but they are not old. That's one thing. Right. On the other hand, we also have this is near core rotation, eh? it's not the surface, huh? okay? So on the other hand, we have old stars that, you know, that rotate quite fast, but maybe not as fast as we thought because local conservation of angular momentum is not working for these stars. Eh? That's something we learned. So I think the, the simplistic picture that you're sort of aiming for is too simplistic in the sense that stars shrink. They stay rigid rotators along the main sequence. This is not at all what we had anticipated. And there are other phenomena at play than rotation for the mixing of the elements. And for the moment, we just have small samples to see correlations as you see here in this graph. There is a correlation between the envelope uh, mixing and the rotation, but it's, the correlation coefficient is literally 0.6. So it's not the only thing that matters. And, and that's why we're putting in this radiative levitation, which is a pain uh, CPU wise. But anyway, with somebody like Aaron Dotter, we have the best person in our collaboration to deal with it, I guess. Um, okay. Great, thanks, thank you. Um, Ramesh, did you wanna go ahead and unmute? me? Um, yeah. So firstly, yeah, thank you very much for this remarkably clear seminar. It's wonderful. Uh, You're so thank you. Yeah, my question or maybe confusion is kind of related to what Charlie was asking. Mm -hmm. So we have a radiative envelope about mm -hmm. this core. The core is spinning rapidly, some omega. The surface is spinning slower. So there must be a whole profile of omega. Oh, well, maybe even I'm wrong on that. But there must be, I expect, a profile of omega as a function of radius. Mm -hmm. And that profile is going to determine things like how the shear instability works or even the mixing and things like that. So what was not clear to me is, are you actually solving for omega of r? 
or is that coming from some model which is using you know some like factor viscosity or alfin or whatever how exactly is that being done yes for, for, thank you for the question very good question well the star that i was uh, showing let me go back to that this star this is the first star. this is a very special star we are trying to do rotation inversion right so um we have the near core rotation rate that we measure straight from the slope we we don't have pressure modes in this in this star uh, else we could do envelope rotation but we can't huh? but in general we do have a profile and for this star it's actually a very special profile because it sort of says that the, it's almost counter rotating the core from the envelope so this is not at all what we had anticipated and what is even also well you could call it controversial some people don't like i'm not very popular in some evolutionary uh, uh, theory uh, communities all these stars uh, that are plotted here and there are many it's not an exception because this one star that we started off was really showing an almost rigid rotation and even a slight counter rotation but the, the almost all these stars on the main sequence and they do cover masses from 1.3 to 9 solar masses nowadays they have almost rigid rotation and they cover the entire main sequence so the simple model of a shrinking core due to angular momentum conservation and an expanding envelope the rotation pro, uh, the rotation estimates that we get do not show that now we don't have profiles for 1800 stars we only have the near core rotation frequency for all these stars but there are uh, about uh, yeah a handful of stars where we see or where we have yes, also okay. envelope rotation yeah. and it's almost rigid so it's not at all the standard classical way of dealing with rotation profiles no yeah so i guess the question is what's keeping it in rigid rotation aha with angular momentum transport that's why i asked is it viscosity or is it magnetic fields what's going on aha i have a backup slide i anticipated this <laughs> you pay good attention. All right. So here are all the stars where we have both near core and envelope rotation. And the envelope rotation is, is in the triangle. Um, this is what I assembled in, uh, in a, a review paper. Okay. And so for the moment, there are two theories being developed that can explain this. One theory is based on internal gravity waves triggered by the core convection at the interface layer. And these waves travel and they, they are very efficient in angular momentum transport. And so I can highly recommend these papers. Uh, Tammy Rogers was the first one who came up with this. She can explain with her uh, numerical simulations, two, three, uh, the hydro simulations, that the rigidity has to stay throughout the life, right? Another family of explanations is magnetism. And here, Jim Fuller wrote a beautiful paper on that on uh, Taylor instability due to a magnetic field that could be hidden inside the core. It's a convective core that rotates fast. So you expect there to be magnetism. And then you can also explain by magnetic diffusion, you could say, that the angular momentum is evacuated from the core to the outer layers, right? I wouldn't claim that these theories are uh proven solid i wouldn't even choose whichever is more convenient i think we are still in an exploratory phase particularly for the main sequence here because we um we don't have rotation profiles yet that's what should come from our mode inversions that we are developing now for gravito inertial modes so um yeah we need fixes people are working on them Several of them are, in fact, already implemented in 1D evolution codes, because there's typically knobs that you can tweak uh, in terms of diffusive processes. If I'm really ambitious, which is what I tend to be, I really want to go to uh, higher dimensions. We need that, because you're actually reformulating three-dimensional, or at least two or three-dimensional phenomena, and you're plugging them into a 1D formula with a, with a diffusion coefficient and this is a limitation thank you
sorry, I was just trying to unmute myself. Um, uh, John Raymond has a, I think, related question about kind of the rotation and how that affects. <clears throat> oh, thanks, that was really an interesting talk. Uh, my Thank question you, was so much the same as what Ramesh asked that I'll ask something completely different. <laughs> uh, in the solar case, it's proven to be fairly difficult to get uh, G mode measurements. Is there sort of a one sentence explanation for why it works better in many of the stars that you've looked at? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, sure. So in solar type stars, if you have G modes cannot propagate into a convective envelope, let me, that's the basic answer, right? And so the G modes in the sun, yeah, uh, they are probably there, but we just can't detect them, right? And so here we don't have that problem because we have a fully radiative outer envelope and there's nothing preventing us from detecting them, let's say, right? Um, and, and, and the, the, the G-mode's cavity uh, of these stars, in fact, I also have a plot for that. <laughs> uh, you see that here, you know. Um, so this is the brunt faisala frequency of a stellar model. This is an F star. Uh, here you have all the, the G-modes propagating. Here you see this, uh, the P-modes. And for this star, there's only a very thin convective outer layer. So there's no problem for the modes to reach the surface and to reach us observers. So, um, it's a, it's a natural consequence of, uh, of, of stars having a, a convective core and a radiative envelope. Um, there's a whole bunch of excitation mechanisms that I didn't discuss, but we understand fairly well how these modes get excited. I always say it's very difficult uh, not to oscillate huh? <laughs> for any object. Uh, and then it's a matter to get this information out of the data. And of course, um, um, we have an easy time now with uh, with the Kepler data, also with the test data, to detect the eigenfrequencies uh, uh, of coherent modes, as I call it. Eh? So uh, uh, damped uh, modes are much harder to detect unless the damping time is, is long enough, right? So, so for the majority of stars, also for evolved red shines, by the way, they have mixed modes, as we call them. Eh? So these are, these are modes that can pass this evanescent region that's in white here. Eh? Once your star evolves, the orange goes down, the blue goes up, and then you can couple these modes together because the evanescent zone is becomes thin enough. And that's what you see in red giants. And that's why we also were able to detect many of the, uh, well, uh, of, of the core rotation in red giants, actually. It's from mixed modes. They have a pressure mode character in the envelope, but a gravity mode character in the interior. So, you know, it, it, the bottom line is, Gravity modes are all over the place. We just hadn't been able to, to detect them. Um, they're my favorite modes. They, they go deep into the star. That, that's where all the action lies of, of the stellar evolution, right? Great, thanks. Uh, Avi, do you wanna go ahead? Uh, yeah, well, beautiful uh, discussion. Um, I had a question about the implications for um, remnants. So for sun-like stars, of course, the remnant would be white dwarfs. And, um, but um, more massive stars uh, end up in uh, neutron stars or black holes. And, mm -hmm. um, and so the, the spin of the remnant would depend on, indeed, the angular momentum distribution. Mm -hmm. If the core uh, is in core rotation with the envelope, then uh, the rotation period will be quite long. And, so I was wondering, um, do you expect similar processes to operate also at higher mass stars? And um, what are the implications for the remnants, the spin of the remnants? Yes, that's a very good question, of course. And here I need tests because Kepler uh, um, deliberately avoided uh, high mass stars because it's a nuisance for the planet hunters. So with all respect, but TESS is now delivering us uh, um, oscillation signature up to like 50 solar masses. So I'm slowly getting there, right? Um, it's, it's not the beautiful coherent modes that I've used in this talk, but we see more stochastic, uh, stochastics coming and going, but it's gravity, cleanly internal gravity waves. And so I am optimistic uh, as I am as a person, we will have to reinvent new modeling methods because what I didn't discuss here and what is crucial, it sort of was hidden under the carpets in this short talk is that the identification of the uh, modes is critical. 
I need to be able to label the spatial geometry of the modes before I can do my work, so to speak. And for these high mass stars in the test data, um, this is difficult for us for the moment, but it's coming up. And so I wouldn't say that above nine solar masses, which is what you want to know, I wouldn't say that stars rotate rigidly, not at all, because in my early days, it's, it's, it was the contrary. If we had um, uh, so-called beta Cephei stars, they do have a, a more rapidly spinning core than envelope. And so one of my students is actually doing an analysis of a test uh, star right now. Um, it's 15 solar masses. I know it's not where you, I mean, you still want me to go higher, but I have to gradually understand what's going on. And that star has an eight times faster core rotation than envelope rotation. So I am pretty sure that this, the mass regime that Kepler gave us is not at all. These are actually stars that will become white dwarfs, to be honest, because we just reached nine solar masses. So, so the, the higher up, <laughs> I again have to ask for your patience because we the data is sitting in some hard disks right here. Um, and we need uh, more time to develop the methodology. What is blocking us is also because TESS, no matter how beautiful the machine is, it only gives us one year in the continuous viewing zone. And luckily the LMC is in there. So for us, that's great because we will also exploit metallicity effects. But TESS is now doing the third year. So we have one year data, one year gap, one year data. And this sounds simple, but it's not equivalent to three years continuous data. So from a data analysis point of view, we have some work to do, but it will come. I just need, uh, for, you know, I need uh, five more years to come with a concrete spin, progenitor spin, because that's what you want to have, right? Mm -hmm. We will invite uh, you again. Uh, OK. <laughs> I love Boston, so with pleasure, yeah. Um, on, on, uh, on that note, can I ask? One more question about the sort of multidimensional character. Um, uh -huh. yeah. So if, depending on the mechanism and if it's rotation, for example, there might be angular dependence of how these diffusion kind of works, like yes. towards the poles versus towards the equator, and especially as your object becomes opalate. So then does it matter, or in what ways does it matter how mm -hmm. we're viewing this oblate object. I mean, I know that you, besides like the geometric cancellation of the mode itself, like how, maybe you can just talk more about that. I don't have a perfectly formulated question. But. Yes. So the, the, yes, it does matter. Yeah. But there's also good news huh? because if you have an oblate star, you know, it's tilted in some way towards you. And of course, interferometry can tell you how, uh, how it is inclined, but we also get an estimate. This is also being worked out uh, right now. We also get an estimate of the inclination angle from the modes. Um, not straightforwardly because the I'm, I haven't used the amplitudes of the modes. I haven't discussed that at all. Huh? Mm -hmm. That's because we don't know very well how to do it, but working on it as well. But let's assume that we could somehow uh, say all the modes in, in rotationally uh, uh, multiplets, they have the same energy. Huh? This is an untrue statement. It's not true, it's false, but let's assume. Then uh, by have, comparing the amplitudes of the retrograde, prograde and um, zonal modes, you can work out the inclination. This is what, again, solar people can do. If you have sun-like stars, this is just working, right? In our case, it doesn't work like that because the, the mode energy of the prograde, retrograde, and zonal modes is not equal. We know right. this. There are counterexamples where we have an inclination, right? So we know this is not true. Uh, and that's partly also because we have nonlinear phenomena, right? And we would have to unravel that, and then we can estimate an inclination. So we do have some estimates, but the, the error bars are still quite, or the uncertainty regions, I prefer to say, are, are still quite large, but it does make sense what we get out of the seismology. And once you know that, then you can, of course, use that in going to, uh, to uh, 2 or 3D, because you're absolutely right. What we are doing now in, in a one 
one plus one D, as I call it, that eh? one time spatial, one time evolution code like MESA or whatever code you're using. We assume that actually there is cellular rotation. And that rests on the assumption that the horizontal mixing is instantaneous. And that it sort of is an average. <laughs> but I'm sure that real stars, uh, you know, have more imagination than us hydrodynamicists for the moment. Well, so, that's amazing because it's a pathway yeah. to find out. Um, yeah, we, we're trying. So what we, what I, and that's why I, I love this uh, picture so much. Huh? That's what I want to do in the next, before I retire. And this is, this is my path. So uh, along uh, those lines, yeah. uh, with a couple minutes left, yeah. did you want to sort of say uh, any last words and maybe it's, in a well, sense, this picture. Yes, I'm swamped with data, either from astroseismology or from binarity or from clusters, all very good age dating tools. Huh? We are uh, very sure now that our 1D stellar evolution theory is not the end of the story. It has been used for half a century, but we have to do better. We can do better than that. And we can only do it now, actually, thanks to seismology. So it really is a, is a, yeah, a, a measurement from the interior. It's not so surprising for me that we, I mean, people call these surprising results. No, we haven't looked inside stars. And you know, we're looking since uh, a decade now and for these more massive stars, well, we can't scale the sun. Huh? It's, it's tedious mathematical integral equations. And that's what I like because I'm a mathematician by training and it's heavy computational science. So it's, it's computational astrophysics. So my upper right corner of the spinner is sort of, this is being done, it's the observational part. Um, and I'm going gradually, uh, well, I'm in the middle. I've always been in the middle. But we need to we need to do better on the three D by making simulations, and this is not my ballpark. You you have institutes that are really uh, very good at that. I would say it's a matter of having uh, these simulations. They are usually done on a secular time scale, dynamical time scale, not on an evolutionary time scale. And working through this spinner in finding out the best way to have mean field models from these hydro simulations and plugging them into a, a stellar evolution code that can calculate the evolution of flattened spheroids. That's my dream. And with that, I'll shut up. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, this has been such an educational and, and sort of exciting hour. Um, and it's been a real pleasure. So um, I hope everyone will join me in thanking yeah. Professor Ayers. And um, it's been such a pleasure to have you. Uh, Thank you. Us. Uh, likewise, it was a real pleasure to be with you, actually. Uh, and if you have questions, please ask. This is a booming field, and I love working.